Hi, everyone. Sarah Nell Wilson here. So excited to join you for this week's newsletter conversation uh, and as we discuss this topic of emotional salary, which may be a concept that people are not as familiar with. It was something that we've been evolving in our understanding. Joining me on this weekly discussion is my dear friend, good colleague, Dr. Teresa Peterson. Hi, Teresa. Hi, everyone. And for those of you who didn't catch the interview or conversation that Teresa had with our good friend and strategic partner, Brandon Springle, let me take a moment to introduce Brandon to you all. He is literally our favorite human, <laughs> one of our favorite humans yeah. that we get to work the with. The ones I haven't gave birth, given birth to, and then there's Brandon. So there you go, Brandon. It's just that. Wow. <laughs> that is high praise. That's very high praise. We we connected we connected a while back on social media over my book, and then we connected around thinking and thought partnership. And Brandon does a lot of amazing talent development, talent management, leadership development work in his full time job. Uh, and helps us with research. And so we're so excited to keep bringing him forward so you all can meet him and be a part of the great conversations we have. He is based in the South, Tennessee, South Carolina. Why do I always want to say South Carolina? It's not, it's Tennessee. I'm on, I'm on the border of Tennessee, right right in Georgia. Georgia, yep. okay. But like Southern, you know. Yeah, definitely but Southern. I, yeah, no. <laughs> um, I should, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Okay. Georgia. Um, so with that, one of the topics that Brandon had bubbled up, bubbled up to us um, mm -hmm. as we were doing research for various projects we've been working on is this idea of emotional salary. And I want to kick it over to Brandon to talk about this. And then we're just going to have a conversation. And and as you're listening, you know, as always, we love to hear from you, what comes up for you, what's true about this and where do you disagree? What are other things you would add? Um, so please be sure to do that. But this concept of emotional salary is so critical for those of us who are anywhere in the leadership or HR space to be thinking about, and also to be thinking about for those of us who are just our team members in the workplace about what we need. So Brandon, what's emotional salary? So emotional salary essentially is that, that emotional... Um, complement to the financial piece of your your earnings, right? So because of inflation and the economy and different factors, like if somebody's wanting to leave a job, that's a big part of the reason why for more money, because it's difficult to, to make ends meet at times. People are having a very difficult time paying their bills. And just the stress from what's come from the pandemic and things of that nature, it's still going on now. And so this concept of emotional salary has surfaced again uh, pretty intensely lately. And it's been around for about 15 years in academic research, but now it's back full force. And so, you know, I had looked at this uh, content from Achievers Workforce Institute, and they do just different uh, research on, on significant topics. And that's where I found out about it again. And it kind of, I had heard about it before. It was a, an emotional wage but mm. now coming back full surface and just seeing, okay, this is something we definitely need to explore a little bit more. And how do you increase it and things of that nature? Because you can't just keep raising, you know, a wage. So there has to be something more so complimentary to, to help navigate. Yeah. What would you, is there anything that you would add to that, Teresa, or what comes up for you? I really enjoy your use of the word complimentary. Uh, because it's not one or the other, right? But they're they're complement. It's salt and pepper. It feels like to me, like they go together and make every dish a little bit better. Uh, so that was what was coming up for me. I hadn't heard the word like complementary used in that mm, mm. Um, equation, you know. And I I really enjoyed that. Yeah, well, Sarah, what about you? Yeah, I think the thing that I've been chewing on is is we've been thinking about this concept of the emotional wage, which I I even like that, but the emotional yeah. like salary is more often than not, people are taking a cost cut or cut. <laughs> 
because of the emotional salary, um, because of working in an environment where they're not valued, working in an environment where they don't have autonomy or flexibility or freedom over their time, working in an environment where there's high distrust because the organization isn't doing isn't who they say they are, right? Or maybe they're working for uh, a boss who is, uh, you know, le- uh, not supportive at best and and uh, potentially abusive at worst. But then the flip side is we have seen firsthand what is possible when the emotional salary is super duper high, and it always stands out. I I think you know, Teresa, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but whenever we get the privilege of working with a truly highly engaged team, and I don't mean a tolerance team, (laughs) but a highly engaged team, that it feels special. (laughs) I don't know how to say it other than that. And Brandon, I know in your work, I'm sure you see that in your world as well, but it's, it's palpable when the emotional wage, emotional salary is high and it's palpable when it's low. Yeah, I mean, something that comes up in my mind is when we see really highly engaged teams or teams where the emotional wage is very high, um, there's an ease about them. Mm. There's an ease about them even in the hardest moments. You know, they can they can find togetherness. They often um, have inside jokes that include everyone. They're not mm. about someone. Mm. They're a, they're within the group about the work or um, or things that they've done together before. And there's a real ease about it. Um, and I think it's fun because I don't know what the real number is. I think at least 50% of the time people think this is great, but um, I don't know that it's as unique as you think it is. And then mm-hmm. I think the other half is very clearly in the camp of, this is a really unique situation and I, you'll have to, I'm kicking and screaming my way out of here. You know, I'm not going anywhere. So Brandon, how does this show up for you or in the circles uh, that you run in? Yeah, I would say for me, it makes me really focus on cultural architecture and just understanding that, that real genuine culture is a competitive advantage. Um, the, the relationships Um, that we have in the workplace really matter a lot. Like it's very important to feel like you have a friend or or somebody that you can connect to in the workplace. Um, So I just, I just think about the relationship dynamics and how much time we often spend doing work. And if you don't feel safe, if it's a toll, it doesn't really matter how much you earn financially, if it's harmful to your psychology. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 and, and, and especially depending on your industry, it can be even more of a competitive advantage. I mean, there's a lot of industries right now where the labor pool is shrinking. Um, and that's a differentiator. You know what I'm, I'm, I'm was having this moment of, <laughs> I, I had forgotten, I think I'd repressed this memory from my early career. I totally was in a situation where like the cost was super high. I was making more and I took a position with less money simply because I was hoping it could at least be better. (laughs) And then no surprise, the company I left was in legal shambles for a while because of how they treated the students. But um, I digress. Yeah, go ahead. Let's play with the inverse of this for a minute too. Yeah. I, uh, it it resonated with me to hear both of you say that a good culture like that is a competitive advantage. And I completely agree. And I think some people listening might be thinking it's still a nice to have. So mm. I want to rephrase it. Mm. If you do not have a good culture, you are at a competitive disadvantage. Mm. Everyone knows, like P.S., <laughs> everyone knows. Um, people talk about it. I think I think there's still this idea that um, people are loyal and they're not telling the secrets or they're not reaching out for help or they're not telling their friends like, oh, we have an opening, but no, absolutely don't. You don't want to come here or not that department. We all know these stories. Um, so I want to push people to see it, that you're actually disadvantaging yourself, your team, your company, when you're not tending to the culture, when you're not considering the value of, uh, emotional salary. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Cause it's, 
it's not just those companies will overperform. You will always underperform compared to them. Yeah. Retaining people, recruiting people. Uh, I think it's the whole shebang. What? And, and just yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, toxicity is just not sustainable. Like you pay only lasts, but for so long before it's like, okay, I'm used to making <laughs> this amount of money, but I'm not, you know, I can't get used to taking this amount of stress and this burden home with me. And so um, it's just the, the thought process of making that shift to really focus and navigate an environment where you can truly be yourself. You, you are supported. You get recognition for doing things that, you know, you should do, but most importantly, you get appreciation for being a human being, you know, yeah. and it's, 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 you know, it's really bad, bad practice to, to not treat people as humans because we innately desire to be embraced. Even if we don't think that we do, it makes me think of a uh, Maslow's hierarchy, right? You have to get those baseline needs met and then you might go towards esteem and really trying to fulfill that potential. But if you're, you're missing that belongingness and other things like that, trying to get that potential fulfilled, you, you might always find yourself coming back down that, that pyramid yeah, and I, it, I I suspect it's easy for people to wrap their head around the obvious ways that emotional cost can show up, right? A toxic workplace, uh, working for a boss that micromanages you, that doesn't advocate for you. One of the things as I was reading, and Brandon, I think that was you and I were looking at some similar articles that I appreciate it got called out was one of the ways you can think about the emotional salary is through the lens of is your company doing what they say they are and are they behaving in ways that they say they value and and i want to tee that up over to you because brandon you and i've had lots of conversations around how so many companies essentially have identity crisis is how you've labeled it and and i'm curious you know to have you unpack for us just the, why is that a cost, right? Why does that deplete the emotional salary bank? When a company says, we're human first, we care about our people, we're a family. Um, uh, and then what's possible when you're in alignment? So like, yeah, it's getting rid of people who are contributing in ways that are harmful and unproductive and toxic, but it's it's systemic too, right? It isn't just based off of who your manager is. Yeah. So, you know, job seekers align their values to, to company values oftentimes and going through a process and coming into an organization and then you learn, hey, this isn't quite the picture you initially painted. It's a shock to the system. And so it's that cultural misalignment that pops up and it creates cognitive dissonance that you really just can't process because even for a season, it might seem like everything is okay. And that first 90 days, good behavior, you know, but at some point things start to shift and, and true colors begin to show in an environment that's not quite, you know, what it says it is through the value statements and things of that nature. And so um, just, just thinking through how do you tell the truth and no company is going to be perfect, right? There's always going to be things an organization could do better, but, just a clear view in the mirror and then that that proper reflection to the employee base so there's not this shock to the system that exists mm. when there is misalignment mm. Mm. it's uh i i i feel like when people experience companies where there is alignment it's surprising because of how often it's not common Right. You know, oh, we value the people, but all of our behavior is about valuing profits only. We say we are a family, but we, whatever, we do massive layoffs every six months so we can just like get our, uh, you know, financial sheets in order and then we do another hiring or whatever the case might be. Uh, what comes up for you, Teresa? Your use of the word shock to the system mm -hmm. took me back to a similar situation I'd been in. And it 
really truly did feel like a shock to my system that what I was presented and what ended up being in a very short period of time was just painful, Mm. painful. It was a, Mm. it was a painful disconnect and it, and it never got better. Um, because the, the, you know, when you think about employee engagement, right. Or like how I'll do my best work. Well, my hope is completely gone. I've lost trust. I've lost faith. Uh, I can barely get out of my car. I mean, like it, it was truly a shock. Um, so I, I appreciate your use of that, of that word. Like it makes me feel a little misty just recounting that story because it was, um, it was really painful. Yeah. It was really painful. And, and sometimes it's a slow burn too, because, oh, yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we, we've seen it, uh, where a company has strong alignment and then they start pushing for massive growth. And yeah. suddenly everything that made them special, everything that made people proud to work for suddenly wasn't a priority. And, and it's, and, 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 and the shock is almost, you wake up someday and go, I don't even recognize this place. Like what happened? And, and, and the grief, you know, on one hand, there's the sort of buyer's remorse, but when you have been part of a system that worked really well, that was aligned. And then it shifted because leadership changed because strategy changed, you know, um, whatever may have triggered it. And then the value shift that can be just as jarring for folks. And we've witnessed certainly, um, an incredible amount of grief over the loss of what was once was. Yes. And when you think about that, again, if you're, if, if your priority is productivity and I'm spending any amount of energy being sad about who we aren't anymore <laughs> and, and unsure and uncertain and nervous, because I also don't know who we're becoming, um, that's a lot of mental energy and something that I, I, I don't know until just recently, because of some of the situations we've been supporting, if I appreciated how significant that impact is uh, as companies are transitioning and not in losing sight of what made them work really, really well. I think it's really important that um, organizations focus on those, I call them pockets of goodness, right? You have the macro community and then the micro communities. Like for example, you know, we have resource groups in the past. I've led a resource group and I consider that like a micro community and I always look to make sure that that community we were having at a micro level matched the overarching picture because you can have a good moment or you can have a good career Hmm. and things line up. So just want to unpack that a little bit. There's a bigger culture and then there's small community cultures because in every organization, you'll always find really good people, people that you can connect with. And then the overarching um, culture should embody that same environment that you get in the micro culture. If you really want it to be sustainable. It's it's that, that language you're using is valuable from a standpoint of being intentional because right. One of the, depending on there's, there's no, here's the five things you need to do to increase your emotional salary. But we know that there are factors such as Do I have friends at work? Are there people who care about me as a human? Is there somebody who knows my kids' names? Is there somebody who knows my favorite, you know, I think one of the articles talked about my favorite coffee order and ways you can cultivate that sense of community is on a micro level, like employee resource groups or uh, networking opportunities or mentoring opportunities or, or volunteer events, whatever, you know, whatever that might look like. And then on a macro level, What are we doing? How are we holding people accountable to be thinking about this? 